Hi, and welcome to episode three of The Star Report. My third guest is Ibrahim Kamara, who is co-founder of Guap magazine. Guap was founded in 2015 alongside his business partner, Jide Adetunji. Ibrahim takes the role at Guap as CEO slash editor-in-chief. Ibrahim's route into the creative industry is not your typical one, but with Guap being a seven-figure business and a creative agency that has worked with Coca-Cola, Kurt Geiger and many others, it is clear the unconventional is working for him. In today's episode, myself and Ibrahim will discuss his life as a youngster, his journey to co-founding Guap, the projects he has worked on because Guap is also a creative agency, Ibrahim also gives some advice on how to be ruthless with your dreams and then to top it all off, we will be doing the Star Report special of Drab or Fat. I do hope you enjoy the episode and learn from Ibrahim's story as he gives some really useful advice. I appreciate every single person who takes the time to listen and please leave feedback or review as I would love to hear what you think. Be sure to follow the podcast at The Star Report for episode updates and our social media at The Star Report on all platforms for fashion fun. Hi Ibrahim and welcome to The Star Report. Hey, thanks for having me. It's okay, thanks for coming on. Would you like to introduce yourself and say what it is you do within the industry? Cool, so my name is Ibrahim Kamara, co-founder of a platform called Guap. And for those who don't know, Guap is a youth-led media platform that's dedicated to discovering, showcasing, and nurturing emerging creative talent across the creative industries. And yeah, we do a lot of things. Yeah, okay, that's cool. So for those that don't know what a CEO is, I'm kind of silly because everyone's now a CEO this day. Mm-hmm. But for those that know, what, for those that don't know what a CEO is, I think that's very deep is, what, what is that? What do you do? Well, that's a good question. What do I do now? Well, I'd say it's probably just like leading the direction of the team, leading the direction of the company. And yeah, making sure that all the parts are playing into this one big direction. Um, so my day-to-day, I don't have one day-to-day, um, but a lot of my day-to-day does revolve around strategy, speaking to new partners, that bringing the money in, that kind of stuff, and that relationships with clients, that's what my day-to-day. So you have a skin ship of this? Yeah. Huge, and yeah. like that little basically. Not huge, but getting there. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for those that don't know you, tell me a bit about your background. Like, how did you come to where you kind of are? My background. So if we talk about, like, school and stuff, in school, probably, like, same story as, like, lots of kids. So in school, I used to, like, shot drinks and shot donuts and stuff. Um, Like, freeze Lucozade bottles and sell them for a pound. I was that type of kid. But I also used to do music in school, so I was, like, quite creative. Didn't they tell you that the packs aren't allowed to be sold for multi-use? Yeah, yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> have to hustle some way, innit? So I was doing that, and, yeah, I used to do music on the side and, like, doing music. At, a, at that time, in my age group, I was one of the only, like, MCs in my age group in my area. So I used to go around to, like, different areas and, like, meet up with, like, other MCs and stuff. So that was, like, my creative networking start. And then I used to have a studio in my house. So um, people used to come and record at my house um, for like 20 pound an hour stuff. So I always had like like creative, but then also like business mentality. And then, yeah, I think um, going into uni, I kind of stopped making music. Well, the hard drive that had all my music broke. Oh no. And then it just put me off music. And then I just said, oh yeah, I'm going to go more deeper into like the business side of things. But when I was doing music, I was shooting my own videos and doing my own branding and all of that kind of stuff. So a lot of stuff stemmed from my music career. And then, yeah, when it came to like business and the magazine, me and my business partner wanted to make something that we didn't see out there. So a lot of the time when we was growing up, all the other platforms that were out here, they were just showing music, but there wasn't anything that was showcasing all the other creative paths. And we was like, that's probably one of the reasons why a lot of young black people or young black men end up wanting to be footballers or rappers or like be doctors accounts because that's what's shown to us. So we said we wanted to be the platform to show all the other things you can be so that we can show like tangible role models for people to aspire to. 
and do it based off talent, not just hype. So we said we wanted to make sure if we care about someone or if we think someone's sick, we're going to put them on. So I think, yeah, we kind of just used that underlying message to build out the platform. And obviously because of music, I had certain people in my network. So when we first started coming up, I would interview everyone I knew and people around me. And then it kind of just like grew from there. Okay. When did you meet Jude? When did you meet your partner? Uh, me and Jude went to the same college. Okay. So we was actually in the same economics class. Okay. But then we went to the same uni as well. Okay. But then at uni, there was only a few of us from like South London that actually went. Okay. So then we all kind of came closer Thank together you. and stuff because we went to the same college and stuff. I thought that's a good thing to know. You yeah. did like economics in sixth form. What were your sixth form subjects? Do you remember? Yeah, my college? sixth form, my college subjects were maths, economics, accounting and media. Okay, I find that so funny because what you do now yeah. and all that heavy, heavy math stuff is just total polar opposites, basically. People say that, but me and Jada always say we're businessmen first. Yeah. So obviously our business is in the creative industry, yeah. but we are business first. Okay. So I think that's even why we've managed to get to the position we're in because we didn't come in this creative first. And a lot of people who come in this creative first don't have the business acumen. But we came in business first. But our business is in creativity. Okay. So that's how we've been able to like monetize it to the way it is and stuff. Do you get me? So you kind of like got the best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Sense. Okay, so you say your business first and all that stuff, but we can see you've always had the business mind. You know, you shot mm. in school, mm. you know, you went to do economics. I always laugh about the degree you studied, not because it's not a serious degree, but it's because you don't normally think traditionally, if you want to become an editor in chief, you want to become a CEO of a magazine, yeah, yeah. go and study what you studied. But I'm going to let you say what you studied because it's actually so shocking. Yeah, I studied accounting and finance. Why? <laughs> Why? Because I was good at it. I'm literally, like, honestly, like not even on a big headed one, but I've, I'm one of those people that have, I'm in tap with both sides of my brain. Yeah. So I'm actually good at creative stuff, but I'm actually very good at academic stuff. You said his left well. hemisphere and his right hemisphere yeah, no, correspond. I, I, I actually, yeah, like, I'm lucky enough to have that. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm academically smart. My brother's actually like that. Like, he has the creative space and he has the yeah, art space. Some of know. us are blessed. Yeah, some of you guys, not, not, <laughs> not all of us, you yeah. know. And I actually like, I like numbers. I like, I actually like Excel sheets. Like, before Ew. we came in, like, I was doing a spreadsheet. Like, I actually enjoy numbers and... Yeah. The time I spent doing a buying internship, I was living on Excel sheets. I can't, yeah, I can't I do them that too I much. I love formulas and that. No, mm. that is not nice. But why account and finance? Like you were good at it. Okay, cool. But you, did you, you said you met today in college? So mm. you kind of knew that you wanted to do this with him in college, or did this? No, was no, no. Me and him were close in college. We okay. just knew of each other. Okay. And we were friends through a friend. Okay. And, um, but then in uni, there was one. I, I don't. To this day, I don't even remember where it was going, but we was with each other one day in the summer holiday. And then we had like a proper conversation. And in that conversation, we realized that we're quite alike. Okay. And like, we done a project together called Af Party, which was like a traditional African party for university students. And he had formed like an investment group, which was like a group of friends who would invest in business ideas together. And that was the first idea. And that idea flopped. But in that process, we realised me and him like work really good together out of all the people that were in it. So it kind of stemmed from that. That's yeah. unique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a unique story to me in a business partner. Yeah, 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 yeah. But okay, so cool, accounting and finance. So it was there you kind of got the look into yeah, yeah. wanting to be a creative. Yeah. But accounting and finance to a magazine. Obviously, I know back in your day, you know, the traditional so route was... Back in your day. The traditional <laughs> route was going to university. You're not you're not old. So back in your day might not be the, the right word to oh, use, no, it's, but it's, you know. It's, it's definitely old time. How old am I now? 28. 28. Mm. Okay, so you're, yeah, you're a bit older than yeah, me. Yeah, a bit older. So it's like, was that because, you know, your parents kind of pushed the fact that you were academically smart and they just said, yes, go to university. That's it wasn't even thing. parents. Obviously, subconsciously parents, but literally at that time... That's just what you've done, isn't it? Like after school or you go work. But most people didn't really go work. You just go to uni just because. And like literally in our age group and in our area, our ends like South London, we genuinely were like one of the first people to do business. Like it, it wasn't a thing for people. Like the way it is now where people are just starting businesses left, right and centre. 
it was not like that. Like people looked at us like we were mad. Like actually like finishing uni and like doing business. It, it, and especially like doing a magazine and especially because there was no like template to follow and people hadn't seen magazine doesn't relate to money. Like in, in, in the ends is world, like having a magazine doesn't like people wouldn't understand how you can make money from that. So people looked at us like, yeah, you're like, what, what do you mean you're just doing a magazine? Do you get me? So yeah, it was, it was, it, it was it was partly the parents that made us go uni, but then yeah, after that it kind of was like yeah, pretty cool. But do you not think obviously you said that back then it was like a kind of just go like you just go to university? Do you think that's different now? Like if you know you have that creative thing and you don't necessarily just run to university, 100%. like because I know people's parents will still kind of push yeah, that people's narrative. People's parents and say whatever, yeah. But I feel like what this generation has that we didn't have is examples. Like, in what sense? So like, let's say if there's a young black kid or a young black boy that wants to make a magazine, he can now go and say, oh, Ibrahim and Jude have a magazine and they make a million pounds a year from a magazine. So they can tell their parent that and their parent can go and check it and ch they can use that as a template for why my kids should follow this path. If uh, my, my daughter wants to be a YouTuber, she can go and look at someone like Nella Rose or Patricia Bright and be like, hey, yeah, like, I've seen that there's money in this. Before, there wasn't a, like, when you say these creative things or these jobs, it didn't equate to money, so your parents wouldn't get it. Yeah. But now there's examples of it equating to money, mm -hmm. so they they will allow you to do it because they know there's potential in it. Before, they didn't see potential in it. Okay. That's why I feel like it's different. And for those parents that aren't necessarily in tune with how the world is going in the more creative spaces, mm -hmm. what do you recommend for those kids that want to use you and want to use people like Patricia Bright and Nella Rose yeah. as examples, but necessarily can't get through to their parents? Because some people do still have really traditional parents. Yeah, I hear it, but then it's, it's your life, isn't it? Like, at the end of the day, whether they're your parents or not, it's your life. That that, that, that would be my straight up answer, because yeah, you want to make your parents proud and all of that stuff, but you can't live for another person, whether that's your dad, whether that's your mum, whether that's your brother, whether that, like you can't live for another person. It's your life. So if you are allowing that to take control of your life, that's something you're going to have to fight for yourself. But at the end of the day, it's your life. Yeah. And I guess because there are people out there doing it, you do have a shot. Like you can see that this could actually 100%. work for me. With the internet, there is no barriers to entry. Yeah, I even saw a quote by Michael Maria the other day about like people wanting to get into the industry and like, saying there's like there's no gatekeepers anymore, yeah, like no, no one can really hold it back like, from you. Me and Jide always say we built our own industry, like we are our own industry. So the networks we have, the relationships we have, the, the places we're in, no one can come and just take that because we never went through to someone to get to where we're at. Every single relationship, every single door we've gone in has been off something we've done ourselves. So no one can just come and say, hey, your network is done or like take away everything that can't happen. And that's what building your own industry means to me. It's like, go out and go out there and really build from the ground up. Care about every single relationship you have, care about every single person that's following you, all that kind of stuff. And then you, no one will be able to take that away from you uh, if you build that connection with the community you're building and stuff, so. I yeah. think that's a really good point you actually made there about like nurturing every connection you have. Right. Like a lot of people just go straight to the top. Like I know I was a, I was a victim of it before, like before when I'd want to do something, I'd go and like search the editor in chief or the CEO on like LinkedIn or Instagram mm -hmm. and I'd be trying to DM them. But I remember we and you were having a conversation and you told me about actually maybe going for people that are like assistants, the same 100%. level at where you are and then try and talk to them. Cause most times they actually have not more influence, but they have more of a say in what more goes on. And those are the future, like a lot of the people that I work with now and a lot of my peers, we all used to be at the same parties together five years ago. And we all used to like chill or support each other. Like when someone would get like a, their first radio interview and all that, like we all used to support each other. Now those same people are now seniors in their jobs or their move working at this company, working at that company. So it's like, if you work horizontally, don't like you're, you'll be able to be aligned with the future leaders rather than who's at the top now. Cause the people at the top now, they're gonna go in a couple of years. You know what I'm saying? This stuff, um, 
it like cycles. It cycles, recycles yeah. every couple of years. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, no one's gonna stay at the top forever. Do you get me? So you're better off aligning with the future yeah. versions of what um, those people are. Okay. So you just spoke about your peers and stuff like that, yeah, which yeah. is a really good note to say. Obviously, you kind of spoke to us about how you have no set day in your life. Like, I can't mm. necessarily ask you the question about what a day in your life entails because every day is kind of different. But to give a general scope, what yeah, would you just spend your time doing, kind of? A lot of my time is spent thinking. You said this to me and I actually burst out laughing. What do you mean? You just no, sit here I and just sit like... and think. And, and just let it be. Yeah, a lot of my time is spent thinking. That, 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 that's, 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 that's the truth. Like, I think that's all, all aspiring, that's, that's getting paid millions to think. Set of time, thinking, strategy, planning. That's like, I, it used to be execution, but now the team execute. Okay. So, so a lot of my time is actually like thinking and writing things down. Okay, so CEO, execution, delegation. I think a big thing about being a CEO and owning your own business is the fact that you need to be able to delegate. Oh, Luckily, yeah, 100% you have a great partner that probably comes and backs you and obviously contradicts your ideas when you need that. But like, I know for me, my podcast and my baby, I can't even let things go properly without having to kind of scrutinize every step. How mm -hmm. did you kind of get to the point where you were just allowed, able to allow people to just have that creative flow and be able to um, let them be and trust in their stuff? Yeah, I think it is that word trust in it. Trust doesn't come overnight. People have to build trust. And I think if you allow people to, or give people the opportunities to earn your trust and build that trust, it makes it easier to delegate. If you keep that to yourself rather than, yeah, allowing people to do what you've hired them for, allowing people to come into the team and yeah, like give them the opportunity to build that trust with you, then you're forever gonna be holding it towards yourself. And I think it also depends on your vision and stuff. If you are trying to build something that's bigger than yourself, then it can't just be around you. You've got to let people in to make it better. So I think Guap will always be first and Guap will always win. So no matter what me and my business partners' um, thoughts are or um, personal approaches are, it will always be what's best for Guap. And what's best for Guap is p allowing people to get on board and helping us get to the next level. Okay, that's that's a nice, really yeah. well executed answer. Yeah. So GWAP is an acronym for what? You said earlier Great what you do. Great understanding and power. Great understanding and power. Where did that name come from? Um, obviously, GWAP in colloquial terms is money. Oh. Yeah, like, from, oh, yeah. like, if you're from ENDS, like, people say, yeah, GWAP. So that's money. I never knew that. Like, no, no, I, no, it that. makes sense now, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I didn't, I didn't know that. You must be young. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, Guap is money. But then obviously like with branding, one of the key elements of branding is like making things that are like having a bit of nostalgia, but then innovating. So the nostalgia comes from the word Guap. People want know what have heard of that word before, but then making it mean something else and great understanding and power. So, so Guap started as a magazine basically. How did you and Jide do that? Was it a thing where you'd organise your own editorials with friends or how yeah. would that work basically? For those people that would use you as the blueprint, how did they start um, basically? We started as a video magazine and the reason why we called it that is because... Wait, what is a video magazine? Yeah, Sorry. So that's a, with like, we went on Wikipedia and typed magazine. A magazine, it said a magazine is a collection of items. And then it said it could be written articles, blah, blah, blah. And then when we read that, we was like, okay, so if if they're not using words and we're like, if we're shooting videos, it would be a video magazine. And obviously that wasn't a term, but we said, if we have a collection of videos, then we can call it a video magazine. And I'm not a writer and Jide is not a writer, but I had the camera and stuff from my music and stuff. So we literally said, we're gonna call it a video magazine and create video articles instead of written articles. So we literally just went around shooting videos. He would do the interviews. I would edit and shoot the videos. And then, yeah, bring pieces together and that would be the video article. So that's why we called it a video magazine at first, yeah. A two-man team did that? two-man team. No, like, no help from outside? It was literally just you and yeah, Jide? Yeah, literally. My final year at uni, 
he was on placement year in London and literally on the weekends, every weekend we would shoot. You know, I find that actually a really good point to mention. You said he was on a placement, so he was full-time working on that placement. full-time working. And then he was doing his dreams on the side. Mm. So you literally can make your dream work on the side, but it's about motivation. No. Yeah. You're ruthless with this thing, because when I always ask, when I always speak to you about how I'm like not really feeling or I'm not really in the mood, you're like, okay, but it's not going to do it by itself. Yeah, that's Where did that motivation come from? I don't think it's motivation. I think life is simple. If you want to do it, you do it. If you don't, don't. Life is not as simple as that. Why is, why is it not? There's so many factors that come okay. into it. But isn't that life? Not okay. <laughs> you do it or you don't, basically. Yeah, you do it or you don't. There are factors. Of, I'm not going to that. There are factors, but it's not hard and it's not simple. Like, I mean, it doesn't make it hard or it doesn't make... It's, if that's what's been put on your plate in your life, that's what's been put on your plate in your life. You have to... Think, you can't think of the what ifs or the um, what I don't have or what I do have. Like, just, yeah, use what you have and make, like, do what you can. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not meant to be easy. If it was easy, everyone would do it. Like... So when people say these things like, oh, yeah, I want to give... Like, me and Jide have never felt like giving up. If it, the, For you to think you're going to... For you to even have a thought of giving up, then you must not really want... Like, it's, you must not really want it. Because it's like, there should be no plan B if this is what you're trying to do. So there shouldn't even... Like, giving up shouldn't even be in your vocabulary. There should be no plan B. You know what, that's so funny because I don't even have a plan B for a lot yeah. of the things I do. I always say I need plan Bs, but I feel nah, like you don't. for a plan B, you still have to be dedicated to that plan B. So can it really be nah, a backup I plan? don't think there. No, nah, I, I generally feel like, and again, I can only talk from my experience as someone who, who there was no template to follow and it actually worked out. If I had the plan B, it, I don't think I'd be here. Like, I, I used to work at Tesco for, like, four or five months after uni. I left that job, and we was out here hustling for about probably, like, four years until we made, like, proper money. Do you know what I'm saying? But if I had done anything else, that four years could have been ten years, or that four years could have been eight years. And, yeah, four years seems long but not in the grand scheme of 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, do you get me? So, yeah, I, I, I don't really see, especially people living in this side of the world and, like, being in London and stuff, I don't really see, I, I'm, I'm not really, not excuses, but there's there's no reason for you to You're not You're a bit more privileged than yeah, other man. people on the other side. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. That does make a lot of sense. But that was a good note. Like, you were working at Tesco, so you kind of had that stable income. Definitely not. Tesco, you're getting paid I something, at though. Tesco for four months, and it was, like, three bills a month. But you still know you had that coming in, do you know what I mean? Yeah. In that sense. Okay. How did you transition to, like, just going out into the world and not knowing you were going to have that income coming in? Because I think that's a lot of people. Like, people are scared to leave their nine-to-fives because they don't know. I think for me... That wasn't enough pay for my dreams. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, the opportunity cost of making three hundred pound a month, compared to actually building myself, that that that's not worth it. Do you get me? So, I I always say it's harder for you to do things you don't want to do. It wasn't really hard for me to make that decision because I didn't want to be at Tesco. I didn't want to be living off three bills a month. So I'd done what I wanted to do. And yeah, obviously it's hard and like, it's kind of scary and that, but it's what I wanted to do. And I think in my journey, that's one thing that's like consistent. I've always done what I wanted to do. Like I'd always followed my own instinct and my own gut. And I think the more you do that, the easier it is for you to like actually make decisions that are gonna better yourself rather than better than other people and stuff. So it, it it's not really your fault for me now. Like when I wanna do something, I'm doing it. If I don't wanna do it, I'm not doing it. I think that's the power of saying no as well, isn't yeah. it? That that's where that whole no thing comes. I'm working on that. I'm working on saying no to people because I feel like that's something I struggle with. <laughs> but you seem to have mastered the whole if you don't wanna do it, I'm not doing it thing. Yeah, I, just, I think, again, I, I think I don't really do gray area. I'm kind of like black and white. 
So it was like... I don't believe in the grey area, though. Yeah, but a lot of people live in that area. So, but I'm either yes, no, I don't like you, I like you. Like, I, like it's, I'm very straight to the point. But I think that helps me navigate because I don't like miscommunication. I like clear. And if I don't understand, I'll let you know I don't understand. I like, I like to... Yeah, be straight with everything. So, yeah, it's, it's helped. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So, obviously, you said that you and Judah used to go around, take do video interviews with people. So, that two-man team has now transcended into a creative agency that has worked with Adidas, Coca-Cola, and most recently became the sole creative direction agency for Kurt Geiger. Yeah, yeah. Really big congratulations to yeah, your yeah, team yeah. and you for that. How did you guys land that? Did you approach them? Did they approach you? We've never approached a client for work. You've never approached anybody for work? So even in your early onset days? Every single job that's come to us has come to us because of what we do in the magazine. Yeah, we don't, we've never approached a client for work. That must have been a huge achievement though, not just for like your team, but for like everyone that's kind of black or of color to know that they could actually be the leading agency for a, for a huge brand. Like Kurt Geiger is known world renowned. Yeah, 100. Yeah, it's, it's a big achievement. It's a huge achievement. Um, very happy. I think we were very happy for what it represents, I think. In the sense of the people? In, in, sense, sense, of in, sense, of, in, in sense of, like, yeah, like, you can be from ends and not change yourself and end up doing stuff like this. Do you get me? Like, you don't always have to be the one in front of the camera. You can actually run a business and make moves like this. I think I like... I'm happy for what that represents for like other young people that want to be coming up in the industry. Do you get me? And like we've got loads of things coming up. Do you know what I'm saying? But in each of those things, I I want them to be opportunities for people to be like, yeah, like we really can do this. Do you get me? That's so sweet. What? <laughs> That's really sweet. That is. Sweet. You just said that like, everything you're doing is for people to have an opportunity coming up. Like That's what I want to do, what I'm trying yeah, to do. That is really sweet. And it's not like you have ill intentions behind it or you're going out of your way to be like, yeah, because I don't think your ideas, obviously, you know, you'll profit off everything. This is your business, but I don't think your ideas, I'm going to get this child, work them oh, to the no, bone no, no. and just take their money not. and just give them peanuts. Something when they're done. we are launching today, it should, be, it should be coming out even a standard. Something we're coming up today is like really big. By the time it comes out, it won't be today. What is it going to be? Uh, yeah, it won't be today, but when they hear the podcast, they'll look back in it. Oh. Yeah, encourage your encourage them to go look at your publication. Yeah, go, go, go look. <laughs> Evening Standard, though, well done. Yeah, yeah, I, have, yeah. I have a friend that works at Evening Standard. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Evening Standard's a big deal. But um, being a creative agency, you've obviously worked on a lot of campaigns. Do you have any favourite campaigns to date? I want to say favourite campaigns. One of my favourite clients is Reebok. Reebok? Do you guys work with Reebok, too? Mm. Is that with everybody? I work with a lot of people. <laughs> what have you got coming with Reebok, kind of? Or what have you? What was the campaign with Reebok? Uh, Reebok was like I feel like Reebok was the first client that we worked with that paid us what we deserved. Yeah, cause I feel like creatives don't un not. I don't know if the right word is don't understand what they deserve, but sometimes because you're a creative, they might just chuck peanuts at you and you think, yeah, yeah no, like I'm getting paid I for my like talent. I feel like Reebok, they allowed us to do what we need to do, and they trusted us a lot, and they gave us the money that was that showed their trust. So I really appreciate that relationship, yeah. So for an emerging creative that is trying to come into this space and do what you kind of do, working with the campaigns with these big companies that people probably dream of working with, what would they have to kind of do? What moves do you think they'd have to take or put in place to get to that type of point? Work. What Work, that's a very vague word, like work. You said you're the blueprint. Graph is the blueprint. I'm, I want my magazine one day. I've come, I've searched you, I've searched you. What, am I, what work am I starting I say, with? Do what you want people to pay you for, for a very long term. So you promote longevity? Consistency and longevity. That word, consistency, whenever you say yeah. it, it makes me so anxious. No, but this is, that's the thing. Loads of people like create one thing and then stop or create multiple things, then stop or take a break and all that stuff but you can't take a break you actually can't and like if you think you can just take a break then that's on you and it like like the one thing that's got us here is that we have consistently put out quality content and our branding our messaging has been the same from when we started like 
it has been very consistent. Our thing has been slow and steady rather than up one year, down one year, up one year. Like it's been very slow and consistent. Do you know what I'm saying? We, but we've never stopped. We've never stopped. And I think that that's allowed when people think about certain words and so when people think about creativity or when people think about diverse or when people think about magazine, when we black, we're probably one of the first people that will come to mind because we've been consistent. When you lose that consistency, you lose that opportunity to become the first in people's mind when they think of certain words and that's how you lose the bag and that's how you don't make the money off of it. Do you get me? Yeah, I guess that makes sense in the terms that like you consistently put yourself out there, eventually people will recognise yeah, what you're like doing. If, if you work really hard at your craft and you co are consistent at it, people will find you. Like, I... I don't know anyone who is like crazy sick that is undiscovered. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I don't At know. some point, that person will be found. Yeah. So I guess it's the whole not wanting the quick fame. Because I feel like, especially in a social media age, everyone's after all the followers, all the Bro, money we, right now. It took us like four years to get to like 10K followers. But by the time we had work, by the, by the time we got to 10K, we had already worked with Nike, we had already worked with Adidas. We, we, we had already worked with like most of the major brands. So you don't think followers cor like correlate uh, with what it's success quality, you could It's quality do. of the audience. Quality of the audience. If you chase numbers, anyone can buy numbers. No one can buy authenticity or impact. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. there's loads of there's loads of magazines, but there's loads of magazines that are not guap. <laughs> like, it's just facts. Like, there there isn't another version of us. Do you get yeah. me? So whether we have millions of followers or whether we have thousands of followers or hundreds of followers, brands know why they're coming to us and brands know our connection with the audience to get me. And that can't be taken away. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously you have the whole creative sphere, but you are, you are also quite analytical. Do you feel like they complement each other in yeah. the sense that you are business first? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Do you feel like there's anything wrong with being so business first? Like, business first, people would take that as I'm chasing money and money solely. What if then people just want to be creative and share their talent and then money comes later? Well, the honest answer, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter what people think about you or in terms of their scope on going into the world? Oh, you said um, about people saying that analytical... Is no, I'm bad. single, quite analytical. No, you know how you said... Um, could it be seen as bad or something like oh, that? Oh, yeah. Could yeah. it be so seen as bad that you're so business first? Yeah, but it's like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you need money to survive? Or? No, it doesn't matter because people are people and every individual is how they are, in it? And if that's what's got me here, I can't say that it's bad. No, that's you a very me? true point. Yeah. I'm sure we'd all love to be business first. No, gonna but the last thing, some people are not business first and they still succeed. Do you get me? Like, yeah. There's not a one size fits all answer yeah. for everyone. Everyone's different. Do you get me? Yeah. So. That's a really important note in terms of success though. I feel like a lot of the time I did it too. Like I'd want to look at someone's career that I really like and I try and copy all their moves. But then you realise later down the line that you can't necessarily copy someone's route for the success. The only thing that is consistent with people is consistency and work. Like there's no there's no secret. Like the only thing everyone's path is different, but the only thing is consist that's consistent. Is that they were consistent and they worked. Yeah. There's no cheat code. Yeah. Do you get me? There, there, there really isn't. So obviously, being a creative, people struggle with burnout. You said that you and Julia never had a day where you wanted to stop. No. You guys are superheroes because no. I know that a lot of people struggle with burnout in terms of when they're not necessarily getting the results that they want. They might feel like this is getting tiring, yeah, even if they're that's consistent. The key. That, man, that's the key. What's the key? What you just said, getting the... Um, getting the results that they want. That's a level of expectancy and a level of entitlement. But if you're out here just working and just appreciating everything that comes your way, you're not going to have that level of entitlement with the world because the world isn't going to give you what you want all the time. The, the world is going to give you what it gives you and you have to be open to accept that. So we didn't come in this thing having this level of entitlement of, oh, because I've worked for one year, I meant to get this, or because I've worked for five years straight, I meant to get this. No, we just worked, put out the content, put out the stuff, and it, what came back from it came back from it. Do you get me? 
and the things that did work and the things that did stick, we would repeat and do the same thing or try to make it better. But we never had that level of entitlement. Like the, the world doesn't owe you nothing. So you can't go around thinking, oh, I should be getting this or I should be getting that, do you get me? So that's why we don't get burned up because we are happy with every stage of the journey. Do you get me? Every little step that we take, every single new follower we have, every new person that comes to us, we appreciate every single one. So with that, that mentality towards it, you're never, yeah, I don't think you're going to have burnout towards it. Yeah. And I feel like another good point there was understanding your content. Like you said, you guys looked at what did well, looked at what didn't yeah, do yeah, well. Yeah. So you kind of just put stuff out, tried and tried. Then what you what did stick, you replicated? Yeah, and it was the same thing with like, knowing when brands started coming to us, we started realizing they're coming for us for certain things. So then it's like, then molding the business a little bit to make sure that you're, you have now, you now have that as like a package and you're able to like sell that properly and all that kind of stuff. But again, you're not going to know that stuff if you don't try and if you just, yeah, just expect things. Okay. So obviously when I first spoke to you, I was quite young. I am still quite young in the general scope of being alive. But when I came to you the first time I spoke to you, I kind of always had that creative idea that I had. Obviously I'm now executing it in a different way to what we first spoke about. But I wasn't ready. I remember telling you, I don't feel ready. You were just like, just start. And I was like, I don't feel ready. You were just like, just start. Like, it doesn't matter. You can fix all that stuff later. Mm -hmm. Do you not feel like there's a certain level of need to be prepared to a certain level? Like, How can you be prepared for something you don't know? <laughs> that confused me. What? How can you be prepared for something you don't know about? In what sense? So that's like me saying I'm going to prepare to be a professional boxer, but I've never boxed. So you The only way you're going to be prepared is by doing it. So you think it doesn't matter the level of what you produce the first time you produce oh, it? If I show you my first issue of Guap, it's nothing compared to what we do now. I got the first, the first cover of Guap is a picture from Pinterest. It doesn't even have a person's face on it. Do you get what I'm saying? But that's not what we do now. Do you get me? But you only know that from doing. Like the best experience is doing. The best experience isn't reading or, or like, or just thinking of what ifs it's, it's doing. So... Yeah, I feel like you can prepare, you could possibly like read as much as you want and all that stuff, but the, the real preparation comes from when you actually do the stuff. Because you won't really know until you Yeah, because you, you won't basically... really know, do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like being a parent. Someone can tell you about being a parent all your life, but when you become a parent, that's completely different to people telling you about it. Yeah, I guess that's a good analogy because obviously people say like, you can buy parenting books, but you know, a parenting book won't really so teach you how to be. A parent. Yeah. 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 Quick question. Do you think there's a difference between a, being a parent and being a guardian? Like, what if that person looks after me and they're my guardian, they love me, but then they're my parent, but right, they're not that, my parent? That's a deeper question. I think that, again, that's to the individual. If you classify the person as your parent. So things are subjective to situations. Yeah, so then go back to what you said earlier about not being ready to start or being ready to start. What if something crazy has just happened, but I know this is my prime time to start? Would you suggest that I start at that moment? Again, that would be subjective to you, innit? If you can actually do it, do it. If, 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 if not. But I don't think that's preparation. That's just you putting a hold because things are happening in your life. Like family stuff are happening. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that's quite different to, um, let's say, working a job and waiting for the right moment for you to start it. The, the, that's an extreme circumstance, the one you're, you're basically describing, mm. I would say. Okay. So we got deep there, so we're going to bring it back <laughs> onto like the level ground. So you went to the Mobos, how were they? It was calm. It was calm. <laughs> That's not very enthusiastic yeah, for how. Yeah, it was calm. It just, it just wasn't what, what it was. What did you no, think of the vibe? Was the vibe good? All our people were there, so it was nice. All our people in terms of the culture people. Like, yeah, like other business owners, people oh. that we came up with and stuff. Aww. Yeah, so it was cool. The people you used to see at the events. When yeah, you used yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. Quick point, events now... You told me that they're held by big... A lot group. more brands and stuff. Yeah. yeah. How did you do it in your day? Back in the day, like there was like small venues, like 100 cap, 150 cap. A lot of these venues were like... Events would be put on by, by like young people that like just wanted to like showcase people. So that like would be like £100 for the venue kind of thing. But a lot of those venues are gone, so that stuff doesn't really happen anymore. So you think the only way you can really showcase your talent now is really social media? Like, there's no events you no, can really get into? No, there is. Like, there's the odd venue popping up now and stuff. The what? 
there's the odd venue popping up okay. now and stuff. So there is certain parts now. But yeah, it's just not the same. Like the, back in the day, surely it used to be like a mad creative spot. It's not really that no more. You don't think so? Nah. All fashion shows are always in Shoreditch. Yeah, fashion shows and stuff, but like, like from the culture, like from the ground oh. events don't really happen no more. That's a shame, I guess. Yeah, it's a big shame. Yeah. So back to the Mobos. You obviously went to the Mobos and you wore a great outfit. I loved your suit. You wore like a native suit. Who mm. was the designer? Labrum. Labrum and who, like what? What is he kind of? Uh, he's a Sri Lankan designer. Did you go to him or did he approach you? No, like I know him. You know him. Yeah, so I said okay. I'm going to. The, I was gonna get a suit from. I was gonna get a suit from one like high end fashion person. They was actually gonna send me a suit, then I was like, mm, my first time at Mobos, I rather represent someone, so I asked him, oh, do you want to give me a suit for it? And just gave me a suit. I love the fact that you take the culture everywhere you go with you. A hundred. I feel like it's not every day that people like us are in certain places or like things. So I feel like, yeah, we have to make sure that people who deserve the opportunity get it, not just people who always get it. I think that's very important to me. That's really nice. Yeah. And obviously that was great publicity for the yeah, Labrum designer because obviously I like this. I don't know who he was. Yeah, now yeah. I know who he is. 100%. And so many others That's that probably sway that day. That's what it's about. Oh. So obviously this is a fashion podcast. So obviously I'm always going to assess the fashion looks. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get into my special of the Drabble Fab. Obviously if you're new to the podcast, Drabble Fab is when we speak about a current fashion event or look thing that has happened and we assess what we think about the looks that have come out and just speak on our opinions, subjective to us, about what we think. So obviously we are in the Fashion Week scope, you know, Milan, New York, London, Paris. Paris most recently had theirs and there was the Louis Vuitton show. Mm. And obviously Virgil passed recently, God rest his soul. But that was his final collection for Louis Vuitton. And I saw this boombox bag trunk case. Did you see it? Mm. You didn't see it. It had like... Um, speakers on the bag and it might I think it said I should like, not have it I it said it said like Louis yeah, yeah. like Louis and spray paint basically and I loved that bag I just felt like it was a real epitome of who Virgil was mm -hmm. you know he was a DJ he was an architect he yes, like yes, he yes. did art it, the bag just spoke about what well, Virgil was, was yeah, yeah. and it was like he left us with that I don't know do you feel like he maybe because he knew his time was coming that's why he left us with such a statement bag oh, yeah, definitely but I felt that that was my fab of the whole Louis, the whole Fashion Week scope in Paris, just because it was so beautiful. Like you don't really see pieces that promote longevity like that, and that's something that I'll remember yeah, forever, yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, I think that that whole show was sick. Really? Yeah, I liked yeah. the the production on it. Yeah, it was so different. I thought I saw people skateboarding, yeah, like people skateboarding down the runway. I also like the fact they had people in there that were like real people that weren't models and stuff. So like yeah. they had people like JoJo. Um, from No Signal in the on, on the catwalk, and it was just like Jojo is not a model, but he was there representing. So I, I like like those little elements of it. Yeah, and I feel like that's another thing. Obviously, because Virgil was a culture person, he didn't really only scope out the biggest, yeah, highest yeah, the end biggest highest. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He liked people that were original, creative, kind of doing their thing. Basically, said about if you've been doing your thing consistently enough, you will be found. Yeah, like the yeah, right people 100%. will find you. Because I even always said like Virgil was one of the people I'd want to meet because I'd see people that I know basically being followed by Virgil, Virgil and yeah. they don't they're not necessarily verified. Like you're not necessarily verified, yeah, yeah, and yeah. you have people that are huge following yeah, yeah, yeah. you. So maybe that's a good. Yeah, but then that's the thing. It's, it's the quality of the audience. It's not about how big the audience and stuff. A lot, of, a lot of that stuff is like perception metrics. You don't want you don't want to be living off perception metrics. You want to be living off quality metrics, metrics. <laughs> real metrics. Yeah, real metrics. Yeah, real metrics. Okay, so then now I'm going to speak about the drab side of it. Obviously, you know, like 2021 was the year of collab, so we had like Sakai times Dior. You're you gonna know. say that Don? The uh, I forgot. I know who you're gonna say. Go on. Um, there was obviously the um. Fendi times Skims. There was so many yeah. different ones. Gucci times Balenciaga. Obviously now we've got like Dior times Birkenstock, oh, and no, it's not, that. it's not really hitting. I don't really like Birkenstocks anyway. I love Birkenstock actually. I, really I like always them. wanted them, and then people were like, "Why are you wearing like sandals?" And it was like, "Just get Yeezy slides." I'm just like, "Okay, I'll just get Yeezy slides." Uh, no, I love Birkenstock. I feel like I'm gonna get a pair this summer. They look cheap. 
They don't look cheap. They're they're nice. They're real leather strap secure. Not for, not for me still. What do you not look do? like African uncle things. First of all, what's wrong with being an African uncle? No, there isn't. I'm African. Yeah, but, exactly. But it just looks like uncle. I wasn't going to say you're an uncle, but you know, if you want to call yourself <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, that's not No, I love still. them. But Dior and Birkenstock did a collab and I mean it. It just looks like nicely decorated clogs. Like, that was not the collab to kick off 2022. Like, it looks like clogs. They've basically done a clog and they stuck flowers on it. The best part of the shoes underneath though, but that's because I love the, repeti- the repetition of the Dior print, like that cute D D D D D thing. Mm-hmm. And then there's like Birkenstock underneath it. Like mm. the back of the print shows some charisma, but the clog vibe is not a bit of no, me. No, not you. Mm. I hear it though. It's high fashion. I'm in it, but I'm not. What do you mean you're in it, but you're not? I don't really care like that. You just like your, what is that top you're wearing? This is Bershka. 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 Minimal. minimal. Okay, so do you I like... I like nice coats. Nice coat. Yeah, you are a coat person. Like I've seen a few coats. of your coats on Instagram. You are a coat person. Yeah, I like coats. So into that minimal fashion, do you like fear of God and essentials and stuff like that? Is that the minimal you're going for? Or what no, type I don't of minimal? Really like, I don't really like brands. What? <laughs> I don't really like brands. The person that works with brands, you yeah, don't really I like mean, brands. I don't, I don't really like brands. Like, I wouldn't go and buy a brand. I, I actually rather would buy from like an upcoming brand than like high fashion brands. Are you saying that because it makes you sound good or are you saying that because it's generally no, a thing? You can go ask my team. <laughs> you can go ask my team. I don't really have high fashion stuff. That's different. Why? Like a lot of people normally chase brands, you know, you want to be seen in the best, you want to be seen in the nicest, you want to be seen in memorable clothing. You can have memorable clothing by like being um, high fashion. But if you're working with upcoming brands, people don't necessarily know them. I'm saying that because everyone's living for everyone right now. Yeah, but they can be nice. Some of them are nicer. You think so? Yeah. So name me like a huge, a good upcoming brand that you've been shopping with recently. Well, one of my coats recently, Noki. Noki. Yeah. I saw you say something about them on Instagram, actually. Cool brand. Cookie. It's a really nice brand. Are they, where are they from? Um, South London. South London. Oh, they're from the ends. Yeah. And their stuff isn't cheap. Like the jacket's like 230 and stuff. I'd rather give it to him than a high fashion brand. Oh, that's so sweet. And Why is it sweet? I but his the coat is nice. It's not yeah, like, no, it's, it's not, not like, like it's a bad it's coat. It's not like I'm doing him charity. Like, no, you paid coat, for the service. Yeah, the coat you, is nice. You got the jacket. But I'm yeah. saying it's sweet that you're even with all your money, you're still trying to you still give it to people yeah, that well, you feel like would be just, good. Like I, I've never been that good person. What person? As in like I've never been like materialistic in that sense of like I need to buy like expensive products and stuff. Yeah, I've never just, I've just, it's just, it's just, it just doesn't. Because you don't necessarily care about image. Mm, no, more we'll just. I like what I like and I don't care about the price. So if if it's cheap, I'd rather buy something cheap and less than something that like mad expensive. Yeah. yeah. I guess that's like that whole Margiela phase. Like when everyone had Margiela's and just because they were expensive, yeah, wasn't so nice. Yeah, like, like the, that, that but, Louis Vuitton thing with like the... F- and that. You don't like that? I don't like that. I like that, you know. Yeah, but you're probably um, trained to like that. Trained in what sense? As a like, society will push certain things for people to no. like. I actually don't like them. Mm. I thought that's debatable, though, because I don't necessarily like all of essential stuff, but the whole world went well, crazy. So what's, what's really nice about that? I think the essential thing, what's so nice about it? It's just but like, you just said you like minimal fashion. Essentials is I minimal do, fashion. But I mean, what is great about that? Just as essentials. Isn't it the fact that it's minimal? No. Because like, I could do minimal, but there would be like maybe like a little bit of deal. What's the deal on the essentials then? Mm. The fact that it says essentials. I think that was similar to the whole Telfar bag thing. Like, yeah, I really yeah, don't so like the Telfar bag. A lot of things are like brand, uh, like our status symbols. That's I was saying that. I was saying that. I don't think Telfar, obviously Telfar's a great design, like respects yeah, yeah. to the brand and everything like that. But I don't think Telfar would be what it is right now if it wasn't for the yeah. sake that all of social media is a clinging lot of things to are it. Data symbols. Jehu Kao is another good one. Who? Jehu Kao. Jehu Kao. Yeah, I like his stuff. He's got a bag. He, he's got like a nice handbag that's got like a nice print. And even that, that's like one, 160, I think. It's a, it's a nice bag. Yeah. Gonna look into that after. Yeah, you look into it. It's good. I'll look into it. Well, obviously, thank you for your fashion insight. We went a yeah, bit yeah, off yeah. there. But um, 
do you, before I kind of let you go, is there anything you wish you kind of knew before you started out? Like, what would you change or do differently if you could go back to when you and Jide met and did the start of GWAP, basically? It's one of those things. I wouldn't change anything. Really? Because uh, I always say, yeah, like, even if anything changed in my life, like growing up, even if like one thing changed, I wouldn't be who I am. Like, yeah, I, that's how I think. I feel like even if I like crossed the road five minutes later than what I did when I crossed that road, so, like something could have happened that would affect my whole life and change the whole thing. So I wouldn't change anything because without everything that happened, there may potentially be a part of me now or today that changed. But what I would say in terms of advice is just trust yourself and like just do it. I think it's gonna be hard. Um but yeah, like just just keep at it. Like consistency will always win. So yeah, that's what I'd say. And obviously it's good that you guys didn't experience burnout. But every business kind of has their growing pains. You know, I'm sure you had your own growing pains going through the whole yeah, yeah. process of getting your business to where it is now. What do you say to navigating your way past growing pains, even when it's like you're in the thick of it, basically? Again, I think if I was working a job, yeah, like if I was employed by someone, there's going to be days where I have good days, where I have bad days. But all in all, it's the job. So for me, that's kind of been my same approach. It's like, no matter what, no matter what the good days are, no matter what the bad days are, this is the life I chose, so I can't complain. So it's more of a thing of, even when there are the growing pains, I will always say to myself, this is what, this is the life I chose. Can't complain, get through it. Do you get what I'm saying? I think my mentality is always solution focused. So all my answers are always going to be solution focused rather than, like holding back focus to get me so my answer will always be yeah this is what it is this is what's on my plate yeah like do it that's that's me and my mentality and for those people that necessarily want to follow in your footsteps you can't like you said the thing about patricia bright you said the thing about nella rose you know just mirroring what they kind of do on youtube making that content how how does someone mirror your journey i think the best way to mirror my journey is train your mentality train it into yeah. as in like the way you perceive the world and like the way you perceive situations and that kind of stuff, like making sure you're doing the best every day to improve how you see certain things. So for me, like a situation can happen. It probably has a bad side. It probably has a good side, but I will never focus on the bad side. I always focus on what can be done or the good side. So I think, training yourself to get to that point will do a lot for people, I think. And like, yeah, will help follow in my steps. Cause I think a lot of my stuff has to do with like problem solving and solution focused approach to things. So, yeah. You are so wise. <laughs> you are so wise. Look at you, just, just train your mind, you know. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of stuff is mentality, man. Mentality. Of, like your mentality towards situations, man. Like, yeah. Because yeah. if you have a negative approach to a situation, it'll probably go negative. Whereas if you're optimistic and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And just accept it. Like, like even things like what my dad passed away recently. Yeah? I'm so like, sorry could, for that again. Yeah, I hear it. Thank you. It's, but I could be here, like, sitting down crying about it. Or I can take the lessons he he basically done with his life and try to... Um, make sure I honour that and like continue the work to make sure that his legacy doesn't die do you get what I'm saying that's two different approaches towards it do you get me and that's not me saying I don't cry about it or anything like that but I can either be the person that uses the situation to hold me back or use it to fuel me forward and I'll always be the person to use it to fuel me forward do you get me so yeah 
Well, obviously, you're amazing. Yeah, thank you thanks, so no much worries. for taking the time no to worries. talk to me. No worries. As I proudly said, you're very into the culture. And you said, you know, you have projects coming up yeah, and things yeah, like yeah. that. So for someone who dreams of working in publications, I would love to be a part of your whole publication, your whole thing. Do you have any opportunities that you're giving out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So by the time this comes out, this will probably be um, out already. So one of the things we're about to drop is... We're launching a year-long program with Adidas to basically fund, mentor, and give resources to 20 emerging creatives from London. So yeah, they'll get access to Guap and Adidas and like they'll be working on briefs and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's like a year-long program. And yeah, anyone from 16 to 28 can apply for that. So that's like a big one that's about to launch. That's amazing. And then yeah, with Guap, we're always, Hiring. Yeah, like we're always hiring and we're always working with like freelancers on different projects and stuff. So, yeah, yeah I think more just like follow Guatmag, G U A P M A G. And yeah, just stay tuned, I would say. Yeah. And for those people that kind of want to talk to you personally, do you yeah, mind yeah. sharing your social media yeah. if he replies to you? Because Ibrahim uh, does not reply. I definitely reply. Um, if you would have been here if I didn't reply. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Ibrahim Kamara <laughs> underscore um, on all socials. All social media. Mm -hmm. And you'll be there for a, yeah, a, um, a, a nice little chat, hopefully. Yeah. You know, with those <laughs> great replies. <laughs> <laughs> well, brilliant. Thank you again so much for taking the time to talk to no me. Worries. I hope whoever has taken the time to listen has learned something from this chat. And yeah, get in contact. And hopefully one of my listeners are, or a few of you are on that scheme. That'd be amazing. Yeah, that'll be lit. Aww. But yeah, apply. But apply. yeah, thanks for having me, honestly. Great, great chat. Bye. See you later. <laughs> <laughs>